Before we get started today, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today and participating in our seminar. As Chris said, my name is Andrew Heap. I'm the Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Geoscience Australia Distinguished uh, Lecturer, Dr. Carol Zanotta. Carol's talk today is entitled, Discovering a Treasure Map. Very apt, as he will highlight today the wonderful work that he and his colleagues have undertaken in determining the global distribution of basin-hosted mineral systems, including the giant ones. Today, Carol, uh, Carol joined Geoscience Australia as a graduate in 2003. He holds a BSc from the University of New South Wales, an MSc in Petroleum Geoscience from Royal Holloway University in London, and a PhD in Geophysics from the University of Cambridge. He is currently the Director of the Mineral Potential of Australia section in GA's Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division, and is happiest working at the interface between Earth Science disciplines. Before Carol begins his presentation, I have the honour of presenting him with a small gift in recognition of his DGAL. Let's see if I can do this. We haven't practised this. Here we go, yeah, Carol. Here we go. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Congratulations, Carol. Cheers. Anyway, over, over to you. Thanks. All right. Uh, I hope everybody can see that. Um, so thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. Uh, and I do want to highlight that uh, the work we'll be presenting today is the result of a marvellous collaboration with very, very gifted people. And I'll be highlighting uh, those as I go through. So when you think of a treasure map, what do you think of? I take it most people have some image of a pirate treasure map. A path through the oceans and on land that leads to X that marks the spot which treasure is buried. Actually, it's part of Earth Science Week, uh, as part of National Science Week uh, and the National Selfie Initiative. There's actually a treasure map that's uh, been drawn out on the Geoscience Australia grounds. The types of treasure that you think is buried there, normally we think of some sort of jewels, uh, coins made of metals. So they're kind of, you know, the refined things, but they are all generally come from the earth. So this talk is about how do we map the earth to work out where to source these treasures? Now, if we want to source these treasures at scale, will that necessitate some form of mining activity? Here's a picture of a mine, and I do wonder what sort of thoughts and feelings does this picture sort of well up within you? I suspect that in many of us, actually, we kind of have a bit of a negative reaction. We probably think that the mining industry is a dirty, dangerous dinosaur and possibly a thing of the past. Yet what I want to convince you over the next few minutes is that it's actually essential in order to meet sustainability goals and to result in a lower carbon future for the world. So. Uh, I want to convince you that it is important that we are able to look for where these resources may well be hidden deep within the earth. The types of resources that I'll be talking about today are the base metals. They consist of lead, copper, zinc and nickel. These resources we generally take for, for granted. They are part of our photovoltaic cells. They are used in construction and electronics, in stainless steel and even in fertilizer. Adding zinc to soils in many parts of China actually increases crop yield significantly. But along with mining of those metals, there are byproducts. Uh, some of them have now been termed critical minerals as they are prone to supply disruptions. Just two examples of these are one is cobalt, which is essential in batteries in uh, electric vehicles. Another one is indium which you're actually interacting with right now, because you're probably looking at me through an LCD screen. So why do we care about them? Well, because they're used in such a vast array of different applications that our society is based on, they underpin our sustainable goals. So the United Nations has put together a blueprint of how to achieve a better and more sustainable future. There are 17 of these goals, and they're there so that we take everybody on board. 
Now, it's not to say that resources underpin every one of them, but they probably underpin at least half of them. And they're certainly significant for affordable and clean energy development and climate action. So this year, the World Bank released a report which says that low carbon technologies, particularly solar, photovoltaics, wind and geothermal, are more mineral intensive relative to fossil fuel technologies. It's generally considered that the production of this clean energy requires four times more copper than using conventional means. So these things are essential. And one could even go as far as to suggest that perhaps mining is essential for the green revolution. So how much do we need? So here is a, ma a plot of the tonnage of copper that has been produced over the years. And you can see that it's growing. It's growing at a rate of about 2.1% per year since uh, the year 2000. If we forecast how much copper we will need, it's predicted that in 26 years, we're going to need as much copper as we've produced in all of history uh, until now. That's a staggering challenge for resource discovery. And it clearly highlights that while recycling is significant to meet that resource challenge, we certainly can't do it by recycling because we're just not gonna pull out the copper that's sitting within our houses. So how much are we looking? Well, that need triggers multiple, I suppose, exploration booms. The most recent one has occurred in the last two decades. And you can see that it, uh, it involved the expenditure of about three and a half times more uh, finance than we had uh, spent on the search beforehand. And these figures are inflation adjusted. So how are we going at finding that copper, just by way of example? This, in this graph, you can see that different copper deposits have been subdivided into how much metal is contained within them. The really dark colours show, show deposits which have over 50 million tonnes of contained copper. They are the world's giants. And they are the ones that are real nation makers. They're significant in national economies. There are others which are also very big, 10 to 15 million tonnes, and the smaller ones we've grouped into one, into one area. The thing that's surprising on this map is that despite that expenditure of the last two decades, we haven't found any of these supergiants. Now, you don't normally know that you stumble across a supergiant when you put the first drill hole into a uh, resource exploration project. But certainly we should be starting to see the signs of these coming through over those last two decades, and we're not. So what do these deposits look like? Well, here's a picture of the giant porphyry copper deposits, which predominantly sustain our copper supply uh, globally. On the right is Chichicamata in Chile. It's the world's biggest deposit of its type. It is kilometers across. On the left is a much more recent discovery in the 1980s in Indonesia. And you can see already how big the operation has become. What's interesting is that as we're not discovering deposits, it means that we're mining areas which have less and less amount of copper per ton of rock that we move. So these deposits are growing bigger and bigger. Another thing that's interesting about these particular deposits is that you can see that they're located in hill country. They're located in mountains. And that has implications in terms of what we can discover. The reason we're discovering less new deposits is because the places where we can kick a rock and find deposits like these in Australia and in much of the world, all those rocks have been kicked. There's still a few more to find at the surface, but predominantly the challenge now is to look undercover. And undercover, it's hard to make these giant deposits economic. So where are they? This is a map of the world of the distribution of those porphyry copper deposits. You can see that there is a very clear belt that runs up on the west side of South America and North America. There are other areas which have significant deposits also that generally adjacent to oceanic regions. And if you put on the distribution of earthquakes, what becomes apparent is that there's a great association between the distribution of earthquakes 
and the locations of these deposits. They almost obscure them in various places. In other words, they form on the edges of tectonic plates. You can see the tectonic plates beautifully come out in this map. In the centre of the oceans, you can see the mid-ocean ridge. So this is a high region. And then you can see the oceanic plate spreading out as if you were to join Africa and South America together. So geologists have been looking at these deposits and wondering what controls the distribution for quite some time. And that concept, that concept of what controls the distribution of the deposits is called a mineral system. In the porphyry copper case, it's associated with the subduction of one tectonic plate underneath, underneath another. And there are earthquakes that basically occur as part of that subduction, which I was showing previously. As the plate subducts, water is lost from it and triggers melting in the mantle wedge. The melts rise under buoyancy to the surface and concentrate metals at the surface. And there are lots of things to study in the entire process to explain why giant deposits form. On the right hand side, you can see that there is a histogram of the number of deposits and the age of those deposits. And generally, they're young. They're less than 500 million years old. Now, you might think, oh my goodness, that's certainly more than ancient history. But for a geologist, it's quite recent. But these porphyry deposits, they form in a class called the magmatic related systems. And we've long thought that their distribution is associated with these tectonic boundaries. But there are other classes of deposits like iron oxide, copper, gold, which I'm not going to go into, and sedimentary hosted deposits, uh, which distribute, which, you know, the verdict is out as to what controls their distribution. And this is the focus of this particular talk. Let's consider copper deposits of this sort. And let's have a look at the giant copper deposit in Lubin, Poland, my home country. Here, you can see the picture is quite different. In Lubin, this, uh, the, this frame, this blue through here, my understanding is that is actually an access point to the underground mine. On the right is a picture of that mine. And you can see that much less rock is being removed in this mining operation. The reason for it is, is that the copper here is concentrated in a 60 to 20 centimetre thick black shale. And the mining operation is happening 700 metres to one kilometre underground. That's phenomenal. Let's have a look at the distribution of these deposits, which appear to have a much lower, I suppose, surface expression compared to those porphyry coppers. The distribution is like so. You can see that they're not associated with those edges of, of, uh, of continents. If I put on the distribution of those earthquakes again, you can see they generally fall in places away from these earthquake locations. So geologists have been studying why these deposits form, and they form in things called sedimentary basins. Basins form during the process of stretching of a tectonic plate. So the tectonic plate thins, we have earthquakes along these little faults, and they form a depression in the surface of the earth into which rivers, flow and deposit sediments or seaways can, can, can flow into. If we have a look at the histogram of these deposits, you can see that they span a much long, larger period of time. In this case, two billion years of Earth history. You can see the deposits are preserved for much longer back. That's because these deposits are much less prone to erosion. And given sedimentary basins cover about 75% of the Earth's surface, there is great potential to find more of these. Geologists who have studied them have predominantly focused on surface processes and the processes that are happening within the sedimentary basins. This is a cartoon of how that system might fall. It requires evaporation, the formation of, uh, of salts you could say, at the surface. And the fluids, which are, are very high in salinity, flow through the basin, scavenging metals as they flow, and they come up on the edges of faults, and they deposit their, um, the, the metals that they carry 
um, ni, uh, ni o on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the seabed. So geologists, in exploration for this type of mineral system, have been predominantly focused on what is the distribution of these types of rocks and where are the basins that can host them. But nevertheless, all you can do is assess a basin uh, one, uh, a time, uh, well, one at a time as we go through. But there is a boundary that hasn't really been considered in a search for these types of deposits. And it's this massive deflection that's associated with the base of the tectonic plates. And it's called the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. It is the most extensive tectonic boundary on the planet, as it underpins every tectonic plate. So let's have a look at its distribution. And this is really the punchline of the talk. It shows you the treasure map for these sedimentary hosted deposits. There are different flavors of these deposits, and that's why they've got circles, triangles, and squares. The squares are the ones that contain the copper. The map shows the variations that occur in the thickness of the tectonic plates. And you can clearly see that the deposits are distributed on the transition from thick portions of the plates to thin along these white regions in through here. Let's just think about what we are looking at uh, in a little bit more detail. So what is the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary? Well, the term was coined by an American geologist called Barrell in 1914. It's an astonishing, uh, I suppose, find, given that this is even before the theory of plate tectonics was established. Lithosphere means rocky. Barrell was concerned about the strength of the, uh, the, the plate so to speak, at the time, that, in, that it can support loads such as mountains. But, though, but once you get over a certain size of load, the, that load is no longer supported just by the strength, and you get a deflection of this, bound, the, this, uh, this layer called the lithosphere. So you infer that beneath it, there must be a layer called the asthenosphere, which accommodates that deflection. He was building on concepts established by Airy and before him, Archimedes, the great Greek uh, philosopher. The lithosphere consists of the crust and the lithospheric mantle. And the mantle generally has a much greater thickness than the crust. If we consider a temperature profile through the continental uh, lithosphere or tectonic plate, it looks something like this. We've got temperature along the x-axis and depth along the y-axis. You can see there is a straight line of that ge geotherm through the lithospheric mantle, which is generally much thicker than the crust. And the straight line, called the conductive geotherm, when it intersects a thing called the adiabat, which occurs within the conducting asthenosphere, or the bubbling asthenosphere, that elbow is where we generally pick the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary from a thermal perspective. There are other ways one could think about what the lithosphere is, but in this particular talk, this is the definition we'll be running with. So for the rest of this talk, what I want to focus on is how was this discovered? So the journey starts on the 10th of May, 2018, at a workshop for the Exploring for the Future program. The program was initiated by the government to look at the potential for energy, minerals, and groundwater across Northern Australia. And it cost $100 million. It was so successful that the government has now pledged to extend it until for another four years at a cost of $125 million. Anyway, halfway through this program, we had a workshop about considering what work do we need to do between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa to work out what are the great areas for future exploration in that region. As part of that workshop, David Houston and David Champion presented some work that we're doing on collecting lead isotopes in this region called the Carpentaria Zinc Belt in Northern Australia. It's a part of the world which has the greatest endowment of zinc of any other place on earth. And what they looked at is um, lead isotopes. There was a talk on this last week uh, by Catherine Walterberg, so I refer you to, do, to that. What I want to point out here is what they realized is that the big deposits 
the sedimentary hosted one in these light uh, blues actually occur on a gradient in a parameter which they call mu, which is a ratio of two types of isotopes. That's enough to say that for this moment there was this gradient. And David Houston made a comment in that talk saying, it seems as if these deposits or the fluids that form them were seen in the basement. I'm not sure if he's ever made that comment since, but it shows you the value of listening to your colleagues' talks, even if you think you know what they're going to say. Because that comment sparked a uh, thought in me. I said, well, if that's the case, maybe I can see it in some geophysical data sets. So I pulled up there and then in the talk a map of the lithosphere boundary, which I had made during my PhD in Cambridge. And you can see here, there's a trail of deposits, those are the ones that Dave has shown, which sit on a little boundary. It's not very clear in this map, but I, may, but I wrote an email there and then while he was speaking, saying, this is a minor miracle, I think. The reason I was able to make this map was because the pioneering work by Keith Priestley and Dan McKenzie in Cambridge, which devised a method of converting um, shear wave velocities uh, to temperature and therefore an ability to map the, uh, the lithosphere and sphenosphere boundary. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Just to, I suppose, highlight um, the significance of uh, this particular find, uh, I've got these two maps. On the left is a map of the total magnetic intensity. It's just one property of rocks. But what you can see here is that there is a very strong north-south alignment of this particular property that we are mapping, which maps out the geology. The deposits, though, are oriented at an angle to this. It's like they have no respect for this map at all, at least at this scale. There are other trends in this map which trend northeast, southwest, where there are other deposits, and then it turns back to north-south up in this part of the region. Yet, if you plot those same deposits, on top of the lithosphere cenosphere boundary, you'll see they, blue they beautifully sit on that transition between thick to thin lithosphere, and they follow a contour, the 170 kilometer contour itself. Now, this is great, right? This is great because you know from your experience of pirate maps that X marks the spot. The deposits are actually sitting at the intersection between these north-south trends and this oblique trend, which is uncorrelated to their distribution. And that's wonderful because it provides a marvelous means of narrowing down the search space. Well, anyway, having looked at those maps, I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, this is kind of cute. It's nice that these deposits kind of follow these trends, but we've only got a handful of these deposits really. So it could be a fluke. We may, this may have just happened by chance. So I kind of sat on that idea thinking I should really test it a little bit better. So a few months later, I had the great fortune of going on a, a, um, a trip to visit the United States Geological Survey and provide them a, a, a seminar series on the type of work that we are doing. And after that, I visited my colleague, Mark Hoggard at Harvard University. Mark, at the time, was working on making better maps of the lithosphere sinistry boundary. And as part of that work, had collated all the existing maps uh, of the LAB uh, across the world. And knowing where the big deposits sit, I thought to myself, hmm, it may well be that those big deposits sit on those boundaries. Anyway, on the flight home, I started compiling a global data set of where those deposits occur. And then the discovery of the global insights came on the 28th of August. I had just been acting uh, branch head and went through a grueling day of meetings. So for some light scientific relief, after my wife had gone to bed, I poured myself a really nice drink and thought, well, let's give this a go. Normally, when you throw more data, things don't get better. The trends get worse. But lo and behold, in this case, we hit the jackpot. I sent this uh, WhatsApp message to Mark going, well, what do you think? Isn't this amazing? They all seem to work. And then I waited for a reply. Nothing came for a day. So I sent him another one. Uh, maybe you don't understand. The dots are the deposits. Uh, you know, they're kind of similar to what we discussed back in Boston. Other deposit classes, such as the porphyry coppers, don't show such a good uh, distribution. And I thought I needed to back it up with some statistics. Still nothing. And I thought, oh, well, maybe it's not so exciting. Anyway, 
it turned out Mark was climbing. So he sent me this picture of him climbing and saying, this looks great. If you can't see Mark in this picture, he's that guy hanging off the edge of the cliff there. So from this point on, it was game on. We wanted to compile a much better inventory of global deposits, improve maps of the LAB across the world and in Australia, run statistical tests, and pose the elusive question, why? Why does this boundary control the distribution of these deposits? So we got to work. It turned out David Houston was way ahead of me. He had already started compiling a marvellous data sets of the lead zinc deposits in Australia and globally. We filled this in with other deposits from the magmatic and the sedimentary hosted class and came up with this particular map. So that was our data set. So how do we actually make those maps of the lithosphere sinosphere boundary? Well, we use a technique called seismic tomography. I've shown you maps of the distribution of earthquakes, which are happening around the world all the time. But they hold information. If we distribute on the Earth's surface a series of seismometer locations, we can measure the arrival time from an earthquake, which goes off, and how long it takes rays from that earthquake to pass and get recorded at those particular stations. What you can see here is that there is a velocity anomaly in this particular movie. And the rays that pass through it have a different travel time and hence are highlighted in red uh, compared to the others. And by if you have enough of these passing ray paths, you're able to build up a picture of what this shape looks like. And it's associated with the distribution of rocks in the subsurface. So this is what uh, we used maps of this type of work that were being produced by GA and by academia to undertake this type of work. What I was showing, when an earthquake goes off, different types of waves are released. There are body waves, P and S, and there's a much bigger wave called surface waves that gets released also. This is the one that we've been using for this particular study. The reason for it is that it has the largest amplitude in terms of arrivals. It also gets trapped in the top 300 kilometers, so corresponds with the thickness of tectonic plates around the world. Different frequencies of these waves or, uh, or periods have different depth penetrations, which allows us to be able to study the structure of the Earth with depth. Now, as part of this study, we didn't actually run these tomography model. We were leveraged ones, which were already available. And the one that we use most to map the world is the one by Schaaf and Lebedev. And here is a picture of the velocity variations at 170 kilometers from a three-dimensional model of the Earth that they produced. The reason we use this particular model the most is because of the way it agrees with other observables, not because of the deposits. Now, we have to turn that velocity information somehow into temperature in order to map the tectonic plates. Already for the previous two years, Fred and Mark were working on this problem. And it's really the crux of the endeavor of this particular work, and they were the brains behind it. What I'm showing you here is how that velocity changes with age of the ocean floor. I showed you previously how earthquakes focus in the middle of the oceans on a ridge and how you can piece together the, uh, the, the continents across that ridge. So knowing uh, people have studied the phenomenon of how that oceanic plate evolves with time, how the temperature of it. And these are these isotherms, 100, 300, 500, 700, and so on. It's called the plate model. But by having that plate model and associating it with the velocities in the, uh, all of the velocities across the oceans, getting the average of those, we can come up with a mathematical formulation of how to convert velocity to temperature. And it's grueling. So I'm really glad to be working with clever people like Fred and Mark at Harvard. And this is the map that they arrive. You can actually see that thinner part of the oceanic plate here in the middle of the oceans that comes through it, in through here. And it 
thickens off towards the continents as it grows in age. But by using the structure of the oceanic plate, they were able to uh, infer what it looks like underneath the continents, piggybacking on the work that uh, uh, Dan uh, and Keith did and very recent experiments on the propagation of waves through media uh, in the labs since then. But the problem with this map is that actually Australia is the least well imaged uh, continent on Earth. There were only six stations across Australia to make this particular map. So we wanted a higher resolution model across Australia. But the problem is, in those more regional models based on a, based on a particular continent, there isn't enough information on, in the tomography models in the oceans around it, so we need other constraints. So here we use information from kimberlites. These are eruptions of magma which pass right from the base of the plate to the surface, and they bring up goodies as they pass. One of the goodies they bring up are diamonds, if the plate is thick enough. And hence, there is lots of information on these types of locations, which are very rare. As the magma comes up, it plucks up with it a thing called a xenolith, or agglomeration of minerals down from the lithospheric mantle. Sometimes only individual crystals get plucked up, which are called xenocrysts. The thing is, these crystals have a record of the temperature and the pressure from which they were plucked up. And that's because they have uh, iron exchange down at those depths with other minerals in which they are in contact with. Using the frozen in chemistry in those particular crystals, we're able to work out what the pressure and temperature is through the plates. And to do that, we've teamed up with Linton Jakes and with Greg and Zach from the ANU. Zach is a PhD student trying to work out how to calibrate those particular uh, conversions in much more accurate manner. But as part of this collaboration, which we had set up actually before the discovery of, uh, of this relationship, was we knew that we were collecting information on, on the mantle and hence we will need to be able to calibrate it to rocks in some way. So uh, there are 15 locations uh, across Australia uh, that, uh, uh, that Linton has compiled. And from these, I'm just going to show you three across Ellendale, Argyll and Merlin. What you see here is temperature versus depth. And it's these that we use to constrain what that straight part in the lithosphere, in the temperature profile through the plate looks like. What we then do is we convert the velocity to temperature and this is what we get at those particular sites. And from that, we're able to make a much better picture of Australia. You can see here on the right is the regional map of Australia. And you can see that the deposits sit beautifully on that 170 kilometer contour. Even Broken Hill, there's a little bit of that contour that sits through here. And I almost fell off my chair when I saw this. It's amazing. And it's amazing that the same contour works for a regional model as the global. Also, the large, the giant uh, um, IOCG deposit, um, Olympic Dam, sits on this particular boundary. This is one of the world's giant deposits, and it's worth over a trillion dollars just in itself, in terms of the contained metal. In order to make these maps, what we need is access to more and more uh, seismic data. So we'll be hopefully able to narrow down the search space. The deposits in the global map sit within 200 kilometers of the boundary. Yet, within Australia, all of the giant deposits sit within just 100 kilometers. And we would like to be able to see whether we can push the resolution even further. To do that, we need to deploy seismometers. And as part of the Exploring for the Future, we did this across Northern Australia. And currently we have a deployment out on the Southwestern corner of the Northern Territory. So how well does this work? Well, if we have a look at the global statistics of it, we can plot the amount of metal that sits in deposits as a function or as a distance of away from the 170 km contour. As I told you, there are different types of sedimentary hosted deposits. That's what these different colored lines um, communicate. The black line is the agglomeration of all of these together. And it says that we find over 85% of these metals within 200 kilometers of the boundary. That is amazing. 
there are no giants which sit away from this particular um, contour. Yet, I told you before that we were concerned with whether the distribution that we see in that Carpenteria zinc belt could be random. So what Mark did is he seeded random distributions of these deposits across the entire world. And that provides this gray line in through here. Now, statisticians have worried about how different are different cumulative distributions like this. And a statistician called Komogorov Smirnov came up with a statistical test for this. And he was able to, inf to work out that uh, a way of quantifying that. And it turns out that there is only one chance in 10 trillion that this black line has been drawn from this random distribution, the gray. In other words, there's one chance in 10 trillion that what we are seeing here is uh, that the distribution is random. In other words, I think we should pay attention to what we've discovered. So why? Why do we see that a boundary down here at hundreds of kilometers depth is controlling a deposit which forms in the near surface? Well, what we think is that these changes in lithospheric thickness localize where basins form. And they also fundamentally control the distribution of the rocks needed to form these deposits. So up on the platform is where we form these evaporites, which are the source of the dense saline brines which flow through the basin, scavenge rocks, uh, scavenge the metals through the rocks, uh, as they flow through the rocks, and then go up to the black shales and deposit uh, uh, and form the deposits. So having armed with all this work, we thought we are ready to submit what we had found to a journal. So on the 31st of December, 2018, we made the first submission. And on the 11th of January, we got rejected, stating that mm, we're not sure this, gonna, this work is gonna be of much interest to a broader audience. We thought, okay, we picked ourselves up, we submitted again on the 14th of March, um, improving the way we have written uh, the manuscript, only to get rejected on the 26th of March. Uh, well, we picked ourselves up quickly again, then we submitted on the 27th of March, I need to be rejected the next day again. Finally, on the 1st of April, we, we, we made a submission to Nature Geoscience and it went out for review. And we received comments back on the 5th of May. The comments, unfortunately, meant more work. The reviewers want to test the, how robust our predictions were. And they wanted us to look at more um, lithosphere asthenosphere boundary maps. We had already looked at quite a few, but in this case, we took different tomography models and converted them to temperature and then mapped out the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. On the top, I'm showing you a model by the Cambridge group from 2016. And you can see that, that while the statistics are not as strong for most of the deposits, they are still highly, highly significant. On the bottom map, while we were going through all these rejections, a number of um, papers were published on higher resolution models, which were building on the work of Schaeff and Levin. So Mark incorporated these into the global map, and it turns out that the statistics actually got better, which was very encouraging. But the editor, the editor wanted more insight as to why. Why do these deposits sit on the edges of a thick lithosphere as opposed to basins that form elsewhere, which is an excellent question. So for that, we need to consider some more details of the mineral system. You see, to form an ore deposit, what you need to do is you need to take a fluid which have a high concentration of metals, which in this particular system sit in areas where you've got either very oxidized, so the y-axis here is the amount of redox. Very oxidized fluids sit up in this realm and reduced fluids sit uh, and reduced conditions sit uh, down the bottom and the temperature from left to right. So you can have high concentrations of lead and zinc and copper, either when you're in the top part of this diagram or on the right of it. But we know these deposits are hosted by black shales, which are the reductant. They're in a sense the trap. So the process is one of uh, going across these solubility boundaries of the metals vertically. 
So there's an operation window where we need to keep temperatures to less than 250 degrees Celsius. But that's a problem because when we have a look at the structure of these basins, and this is a reflection seismic profile or an ultrasound of the earth that you might, uh, an ultrasound like you might have when you go to the doctor, it requires some getting used to in terms of interpretation, but the base of these kind of reflective packages is mapping out the base of the basin. We map it in two-way travel time, but we can convert it to depth. And when we get to the base of the basin, down in through here, we're down at depths of about eight to nine kilometers. And that is above which the, the deposits sit. The problem is that when you get to depths like that, things get rather hot. And we know that it's at the base of these basins in Australia that the source rocks for these deposits lie. So what we needed to do is come up with uh, numerical models of simulations of the temperature structure of basins formed on standard um, lithosphere, which have long been studied by the petroleum industry, as well as basins formed on this thick lithosphere, which have been much less studied. And this is what Mark and Sia did. So what we find is when we look at it on formed on standard um, tectonic plate thicknesses, we see that the basins heat up too much. They get too hot. And given the fluids will be transporting temperature with them, these basins are no good. But basins that are formed on thick cratonic lithosphere actually can be stretched much less and still remain cool uh, in that process or relatively cool. They still get over 100 degrees Celsius, which is good for these systems because they generally form when temperatures greater than about 70, 80 degrees. So this is perfect. We've got a thick basin, which is cool enough. So again, we had a mechanism. So armed with that mechanism, we provided a resubmission on the 9th of December, 2019, and it was reviewed, but it didn't just sail through, it was sent out for a review again. This time it passed provided some additional tweaks, and the final manuscript was accepted on the 15th of May and published on the 29th of June, 2020. So what is the, if you want to get a hold of these treasure maps for Australia and for the world, you can go to Nature Geoscience or a free preprint is available on Earth Archives on this link here. What does this have in it? Well, it's got the story that I'm telling you now in much more detail written up. There is a lot of um, supplementary information on the methods that we've applied. That comes down, uh, you can get this on the online version of this article. Then there is a very extensive supplementary se section which Mark spent a lot of time compiling. It goes through the databases, the mathematics behind all of the analyses that, are, that, that have been part of this work. And it's actually over 90 pages long. And there is also the data. Four global lithosphere centrosphere boundary grids, three new grids across Australia, all of the de deposits, which number over 2,000, the locations of the xenocrysts and xenocrysts and their geochemistry, as well as the geotherms derived from them across Australia. It's a phenomenal piece of work. When it, when it was released, Mark and I basically sat down and we calculated how many hours of work are embedded in this particular publication, and it's over 10,000. That's one person working full time for five years straight without going to meetings. Now, suffice to say, the initial review was wrong. There has been heaps of interest in this work. And it's interestingly enough, because we're able to provide drafts of the manuscript as we went, we didn't have to wait for the publication in Nature Geoscience. We could get the information out to explorers early. And one of the, one of the most interesting publications that we got was, it was even captured by The Economist, following a poster presentation by Fred at the European Geophysical Union. It was here called Scoring Boundaries, right next to a, a article called Do Tapirs Defecate in the Woods? The question had uh, never occurred to me uh, before. So what else have we learned from this? Well, all of you will know that the Earth is a dynamic place. We've got earthquakes and plates on the surface of the Earth move around. So they, they thin and they thicken 
And so it's surprising that the distribution of the ore deposit sits on a certain boundary. The stability of how thick the plates are and how long they can uh, be maintained is a topic of active scientific research. So not only do we provide a treasure map by, uh, by showing this, we also provide a fundamental insight that these edges have been stable for a very long period of time and survive multiple tectonic cycles. You can see here in Northwestern uh, America that the deposits span a billion years of Earth history. And the last billion years has not been an easy ride up there. In Russia, there are certain, there are similarities also. Again, the deposits there span a billion years, yet they sit on the same boundary, which has remained stable. We also see variations in topography. So uh, here's that boundary in the cup interior. On the right is a topography map of Australia. Now, granted, the Australian topography is subdued, but uh, you can see that it still has broad, long wavelength variations, which actually follow or mimic that boundary deep down within the Earth. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, this region saw the acquisition of a wonderful data set called AUM. A plane flew for over a thousand kilometers in each one of these lines and collected information about the conductivity of the Earth. This is some work by uh, Ross Brody and, uh, and uh, Yusin Lee Cooper. The colors, the, the reds, show you conductive regions and they actually map out the distribution of the Cretaceous marine flooding, which resulted in the formation of the Great Artesian Basin. You can see that that basin swings around in the same way as the lithosphere sinosphere boundary swings around in that part of Queensland. And we know that this basin is a great groundwater reservoir for Australia. So in other words, not only is the lithosphere sinosphere boundary influencing the distribution of deposits, but indirectly, it's also influencing the distribution of Australia's groundwater resources. So what next? Well, if we consider the volcanism, which we've looked at the xenoliths, there's more information in that. And actually, the east coast of Australia has been very active over the last 30 or 40 million years in terms of volcanism. They're marked out by these black polygons in through here, which my colleague Paddy at the Australian National University is studying. He's looking at the chemistry of the melt itself that has been come up in these volcanoes and using it to work out what the thickness of the plate is. So the map that you can see here is that lithosphere, sinosphere boundary, slightly in a slightly different color, and the circles show the inferences from the volcanoes. And you can see that the two agree really, really nicely, which is great because we don't just want to study the earth to provide insights into one process. We want to have maps of the earth which can be applied to understand multiple different phenomena. Interestingly enough, these volcanoes hug the Eastern Highlands. So again, the lithosphere sinusoid boundary is an expression, uh, is being expressed in the topography of Australia. But geologists, they may normally rush in their thought as to how old is this boundary. So Marta Kluknik at the ANU is using the same trick that Paddy is using but to look at what do the volcanics through time tell us about the thickness of the Australian plate. And you can see here that again, we've got a slightly different color palette, but there is a great mismatch between the thick lithosphere that is mapped here in central Australia and the thin lithosphere that we get from the volcanoes back through time. So what we're seeing here is that we get insights into when the lithosphere grew, and that may well help us to refine further which bits of this particular, uh, which bits of the lithosphere are prospective for the mineral systems that we want to find. The last bit is going back to why Mark and Fred were studying uh, the, the structure of the lithosphere and the boundary, and it has to do with sea level variation. The problem can be formulated as such, that the last time the Earth experienced carbon dioxide levels at the same concentrations as we currently have 
was three million years ago in the Pliocene. Back then, temperatures are forecast to have been two to three degrees higher and sea level to be over 40 metres higher than it is now. That is catastrophic. It's a very, very bold, I suppose, prediction. But we can use that velocity to temperature conversion and the thickness of the, of the lithosphere as insight. Now, Australia is a perfect place to study this because we've got the exposure of three million year old coastlines uh, on the southern coast of Australia, and they get swamped in the north. Now, as glacial ice caps melt, you would think, or they, as, they, uh, as I, the ice forms form, you'd think that everything should be just sitting on shore now from three million years ago. But that's not the case, because there's another process that's active here. And that's a process of dynamic topography. That is, the Australian plate is moving northwards at a rate of seven centimetres a year, and it's moving over the top of mantle waves. It's surfing them, so to speak. What you're seeing here is a, the grid shows a prediction of what those mantle waves are by modelling that uh, Fred has done from that conversion from velocity to temperature, and they're compared against observables of that process offshore. And you can see that the model and the prediction match beautifully. So what he was able to do then is to model that convective process, that surfing of Australia of the mantle wave, over the last three million years. And these are the changes that he sees in terms of kilometres out in the oceans. Here, he, on the right, is a plot of the observed sea level and the predicted sea level. And you can see they agree very, very well. But you can pose the question, what change in sea level due to melting of ice caps would be required to make these fit best? And the answer is 12.7 metres. In other words, it seems as if by looking at that process of dynamic topography and sea level change, it's likely that three million years ago, sea level was only 12 and a half metres higher. So not 40, but it's still catastrophic. So the last question that I want to pose is, so where is the treasure map? This is some work that Matthew Tay, a graduate, has helped me with. What he did is he looked at uh, making a map which uses that 170 kilometer contour to make a heat map of where the deposits could be found. And that's it shown here. What he's done is he's masked out the regions of Australia, which don't have suitable rocks to host these types of deposits. It actually narrows the search space for this type of deposit from 25% of Australia to about 15. So a significant reduction. The green belt in through here shows you the parts of that contour which sit over 100 kilometers away from any known deposits of this class and the iron oxide copper gold deposits. This effectively highlights the greenfield opportunities uh, for exploration in Australia. Interestingly enough, a number of these opportunities sit within the new focus regions for, for the Exploring for the Future uh, extended program, which sit uh, across, the, which span the Western Australian border and the South Australian border and up to the coastline in Queensland. The last thing that I want to say is, what's the value of these types of insights? Well, if we have a look at the amount of metal that's contained with the world's deposits and say that 100 kilometres around those deposits has been ex explored, which is probably a gross overestimate of how much exploration there actually has been, we find out that one kilometre of the lithosphere sinosphere boundary is worth about $340 million. That's staggering. Not bad if you can find some of that in your backyard. Another way to pose the problem is to say, well, how much, what percentage of that boundary is actually mineralized? It comes out at, to be 26%, uh, given those assumptions. So the estimated value of this green line in Australia is somewhere in the order of between 0.7 and $1.2 trillion. Now that's huge. But one deposit, just Olympic Dam, is worth a trillion. In other words, it's within the ballpark. 
it's really that buried treasure that we are after. Ansel Allen Consulting did an assessment of this um, study and estimated that for every dollar that the Commonwealth government has spent, it's likely that 38 to 194 dollars will go back to Australia or 11 to 58 dollars directly back to the Commonwealth. Already, explorers have used this work to peg ground. But, the, but there is a statement from one explorer that I spoke to, which I think shows the true value of it. She said, I wish I had known this a decade ago um, uh, when my company was exploring in the southwestern region of the Northern Territory. Uh, because it turns out that this region has very little chance for discovery. In other words, it was a lost opportunity cost for them. And if we find these deposits, that's where the jobs of tomorrow will come from. So with that, uh, I want to close. And again, I want to thank my colleagues. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for that wonderful presentation and summary of the, uh, of the work that you've been doing with your colleagues over the last couple of years. Um, we, we have time for maybe one question before we have to finish. So I'll go to one that's come up in the chat. Um, and it is from John Menzies, which is the crustal structure of the Earth has evolved over time. Early in the Earth's history, the lithosphere, lithosphere was unlikely to be as we see it today. This might suggest that there would be an age before which there were few or no types of these deposits. And I was wondering if you wanted to co comment on that. Yeah, sure. So the deposit type that I've been looking at, uh, the sediment hosted, they only really start about 2 billion or 1.8 billion years ago. That's because you require oxidized fluids uh, to form them. So they can't co uh, occur before the atmosphere was actually oxidized. So other deposits, like some of the magmatic type, they span a much longer period of Earth history. And it's actually surprising that things like the nickel deposits actually sit on the edges of even thicker lithosphere than, um, than, than what we found here. But certainly your comment is apt and we need to do more work to work out how those uh, deposits are controlled. But certainly for this type, since about 1.8 billion years ago, these boundaries seem to be predominantly stable. Great, thanks, Carol. Maybe we've got time for just one quick answer to another quick question uh, from, by Michael Thompson, which was quite large gaps in far north Queensland um, in, your, in the passive seismic inf uh, information. And he's wondering whether you can use anthropogenic noise to fill in some of the gaps, i.e. trucks and vehicles. Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, trucks and, uh, and so on do make surface waves. The problem with those is that the source from them doesn't penetrate too deep. It gets attenuated. Um, the gaps in the coverage would be great to fill. But one thing that's really amazing about the tomography method is that because the waves sweep across the earth, you actually have information in areas where you don't have stations. That's why with a modest coverage across the whole planet, you can come up with fairly reliable maps. But to push the fidelity of those, that's where we're going to need uh, better coverages of the seismometers and the trucks we can use to study more in terms of the cover thickness, in terms of where is that exploration frontier. Thanks. Great, thanks, Carol. Have to end the questions there, but uh, uh, absolutely fascinating uh, presentation on the back of some wonderful, uh, globally significant work. So well done to you and your team. Um, uh, that's, that's the end of today's seminar, but please join us next Wednesday for an ensemble seminar entitled Planning for Impact, Mapping and Quantifying the Benefits of Public Sector Geoscience to learn of the impact stemming from the Exploring for the Future program and how this approach might be utilised to demonstrate benefits to, of geoscience more broadly. And then we we'll also join us next Friday on the 28th at 12 o'clock uh, for a special talk by Dr Jessica Stromberg of CSIRO. Uh, entitled Sniffs of an Archean Sediment Hosted Copper System in the World's Oldest Lake, revealing the results of a new study on the complex 2.7 billion year old Dumbina uh, formation of the Pilbara Craton. Uh, this talk will also celebrate We're at Purple Day for 2020. So that's it for now. Please join me next week for those two, two seminars. And, uh, and thank you all for attending and bye for now. <laughs>